Welcome back to the lab. Today we have a relatively simple mission. We need to find an inductor for our PFC. This inductor is critical. It will determine the maximum peak-to-peak -peak ripple current on the DC link and allow our interleave boost converter to work. Let's dive in. An inductor is typically known as a wire which is wrapped around a material capable of channeling magnetic flux. We covered this way back in our component fundamentals video on inductors. An inductor builds magnetic flux in its core when current is passed through it. Inductors resist when the quantity of current flowing through it changes in any way. An inductor attempts to keep the current flowing through it constant. Energy is stored in magnetic flux within that core, and that's where an inductor gets the energy it needs to generate a voltage when the current through it tries to decrease it. it uses that energy stored within it to output some power. The inductance, or the value of an inductor, tells us just how much a particular inductor will resist those changes in current. Higher inductance values leads to stronger resistance to changes in current. However, there's one very, very important mechanism that occurs in real inductors that doesn't happen for ideal ones, and that's saturation. Saturation is the point where a particular magnetic material can no longer effectively store more magnetic flux. As we pump more and more current, more and more flux into the core of a transformer or an inductor, driving it further into saturation, that inductor will start to behave more and more like a wire. The effective inductance drops and will eventually approach zero if we push enough current through. The reason why this occurs is due to some physics within ferrous core materials, uh, materials containing iron. There's many small regions within a core that have a polarity and they're usually aligned in random directions. As we apply more and more current to this inductor, these regions, more of them are aligned to the same polarity as the field applied to it by the windings. This increases the magnetic flux density within the core, or this happens along with an increase in magnetic flux density in the core. But once we've already aligned all of this material to the same direction, well, there's no more regions in the core to align. If we continue to apply more current, there's no more potential for creating magnetic flux. This is a fundamental material property and we're right up against the limit when we enter saturation. Another material property of a particular core material is typically known as AL or the inductance factor. This factor, AL, for a particular material in core geometry is how much inductance will result from one turn of wire around the core. If you need a little more inductance than that, then you can use multiple turns of wire. Awesome! There's only one problem. The more turns that we wrap around the core, the more magnetic flux that will induce at a particular current level. This means that if we need a large inductance, but we also need to withstand a lot of current, we'll need to consider how many turns of wire are required and how close that may push us to saturation. That's why core selection is so critical. We need to make sure that we'll both have enough inductance and never saturate the core. It isn't easy to consider all of this all at once, but it's not impossible either. In designs that are especially particular, or pushing something right to the edge of what's possible, sometimes a material just can't quite get where it needs to be or we can't get there consistently enough. That's when we can use a trick called gapping. Gapping is, well, adding an air gap to the core. This gap has a profound effect. It allows modifying that AL value or the amount of inductance achieved for each turn of wire around a core. Gapping a core has a few other effects as well, but we can't get into all of that all at once. So all of this to say that the core of an inductor is pretty important and there's a lot to consider, but it's not the only part that we need to think about. As an output of our calculations from the core, we will have determined some number of turns that are required for our inductor to get the inductance value that we need, but now there's another game to play. We need to select a specific wire type, wire size, and number of parallel conductors. When running calculations about the windings, we need to know two big things. The first thing is how much wire will we need to carry the required current without excessive heating. That's frequency dependent too, just to make matters a little more messy. And the second thing we need to know is, can we physically fit that much wire on the core? Pretty important. There are cores with a variety of shapes, E cores, toroidal cores, some combination of the two. Some have round windings, other have square windings, but regardless, there's ultimately some area allocated for the wire. And it's important that we don't try to shove too much copper into that area. 
That's typically referred to as the window area. And using the diameter of the wire, we can then calculate how many turns of a particular wire diameter can fit within the window, continue our calculations from there. The losses in the core combined with the losses in the wire result in a total power dissipation that can be used to estimate the maximum core temperature. Pretty sweet, right? So how can we apply this knowledge to our needs? How can we take all of this information to find an inductor for a 2400 watt power factor corrected two-phase boost converter? Well, the first thing we're going to need to remember is that design time isn't free. Neither is the time that we might spend actually winding this inductor after we've designed it. We need to ask ourselves a critical question before we go down this rabbit hole. Could there be an off-the-shelf solution to our problem? Hmm. Well, after some searching, I found one part from Coilcraft that looks promising. Using their online inductor selection tool, the L0451-AL stood out. The inductance, power losses at our frequency, physical size, and cost, well, those all look okay. However, when I reached out to them regarding the peak voltage allowable for this part, they kindly pointed out that the isolation rating between the winding and core is only listed as 100 volts RMS in the datasheet. And they don't have any off-the-shelf parts capable of withstanding the voltages that we're working with. So, dang. That's really a shame. But hey, at least Coilcraft replied to our tech inquiry quickly. Not bad, Coilcraft. Not bad at all. I appreciate you. Alright, so that was a little disappointing, but it's nothing that we can't recover from. Looks like this PFC is just going to require a little more thought. Looks like we need to design a custom inductor. Before we jump the gun here, I want to take a moment to explain the process of inductor design from a high level so we don't leave anyone behind. I see one major decision when starting an inductor design, choosing your analysis method. The first of these methods is what we did for our push-pull transformer a while back. Pick a core, pick a material, and spend a day crunching the numbers in a symbolic math tool like MathCAD to determine if it will meet all of our specifications. We've done this before, it works pretty well, but it's also soul crushing when the end result is, nah, pick a different core and start all over again. So the second option is what we're going to do today. We're going to use a magnetics design tool or a magnetics design assistant. One of these tools, a magnetic design assistant, is capable for performing loss calculations due to AC and DC losses in a custom magnetic component. Now that's just like what we'd be doing in MathCAD or Maple, it's doing the same calculations, but it's doing this iteratively with a lot of different combinations of components to try to find the best one. I decided to use this tool today because, well, the result will probably be more accurate than what I would get on pen and paper. My computer can iterate through a wide variety of core geometries, uh, materials, and winding types in just a couple of hours, and this will likely result in either a cheaper or better performing result. This is an iterative optimization task with many trade-offs and relatively simple computations, and computers are great at executing that. There's a lot of industry standard tools that aid in the design of custom magnetic components. I've personally used the ANSYS suite, PE Expert specifically, but for people on a limited budget, like myself, if you don't have that kind of money to spend, there are other options. And here's what I found in a few minutes of searching that might help you out. The first thing is a tool aptly named Magnetics Designer, which seems to be free, at least in some form. This software claims to have an extensive library of cores and wires, and even the capability to generate spice models with parasitic circuit elements included, so you can pull that into your electronic simulation. That sounds awesome to me. And if you have some time to check out this tool, definitely do it and let us know how it goes in the comments. I've dropped a link in the description for you if you have a little bit of time. That said, the options don't stop there. It seems that nearly every vendor for magnetic components has their own design tool. That's pretty sweet because these companies have a vested interest in whether or not you succeed when using their products. And I would hope that they did a good job when developing these tools. I found three of these tools pretty easily. One was from Ferricube, one was from Meg Inc, and one was from TDK. If I'm seeing three magnetics vendors with this software released, that means that all the other big players probably either already have this capability or are striving to have this capability and they'll get there soon. I love it. I love seeing powerful design tools being released for free. Hats off to you guys. Links are all below. If you're wondering which of these vendors is the best, well, my answer is that 
Each of these vendors probably makes a material and a slightly different core geometry that is slightly better for at least one specific application. But more importantly, all of these vendors make core materials that meet their specifications. Choosing a vendor will likely have more to do with who has the most competitive pricing for what you're looking for, what's most available to you, or leveraging any designer support partnerships that you might have. Now, I don't think there's clearly one universally right or best magnetics component supplier as long as your supplier is delivering product on time at a reasonable price and it meets its specs. So we're armed to the teeth now with accessible simulation software and we've talked a bit about how to decide which vendor you might want to use for your core. Time to put this software to work then. If this is your first time walking through something like this, there are four basic steps to follow when using magnetics design tool. First, we need to determine the electrical stresses applied to the inductor or transformer. This is an input to our analysis. In this case, that's the inductance, switching frequency, maximum applied voltage, output current, and maximum duty cycle. We've solved for all of these parameters in our previous calculations for the PFC, so now all we have to do is plug in the numbers. Our design goal for this inductor requires 180 microhenries, an average output current of 10 amps per phase, and a ripple current of 5.3 amps in each inductor at a duty cycle of 80%. Remember, there are two phases in this boost converter, so the current will be shared approximately equally between them. We've just set the stage for step two, and now we need to think about what magnetic component vendors we'd prefer to use, what types and sizes of wire, what vendors to leverage for our core materials, what general shape of core we'd like to use, and ultimately, we need to pick a good variety of core geometries, core materials, and sizes, so our design tool has something to work with, so it has something to iterate through. If you have absolutely no idea where to start, I found that Epcos or TDK has some good options available on Digikey and Mauser in small quantities at reasonable prices. Your mileage may vary, but that's what I've seen where I live. Now this is where the software does some great work for us and saves a lot of time. Our design assistant software will iteratively step through every selected core geometry, every wire size, every wire type, every core material, calculating the losses in each resulting inductor. From the thousands and thousands of possible solutions, it will return a few results with the lowest losses. That's where step three kicks in. We need to interpret those results, leveraging our experience to analyze the performance, construction, and cost. And if we find something reasonable here, if we find a good solution, then great. If not, well, we might need to tweak the core geometries until a good solution is found. Typically, the largest cores will result in the lowest losses and the highest efficiency, but they might also be the most expensive, largest, and well, they just might not be a good total solution. So what I did is I kept forcing our simulation tool to use smaller and smaller cores until I found a good balance between size, cost, and performance. Making sure that the design software is picking reasonable parts is very important. Blindly accepting the first result will likely not be a great approach. One really needs to understand how an inductor works and what matters most for their application in order to design an optimized inductor, regardless of who's actually doing the math. If you have questions, head down to our comment section or tag us with your question on Twitter. We'll gladly answer your question or find a great mentor to answer on our behalf. Speaking of reasonable, step four. Once we've narrowed the design options down to one, the best solution for our application, the best balance point that we could find, well, it's time to buy some parts and start winding or have someone else build it for us. There are some companies that will wind custom inductors for you, but I'm not really in the mood for spending money that doesn't need to be spent. Our quantities are one to four. I can manage quantities of one to four. If we were talking about tens or hundreds of parts, now that would be a different story. We have two big designs to talk about and one uses a toroidal core and the other uses a standard E-core. Let's talk about the two options that we found and some of the trade-offs between them. Our toroidal inductor starts with a 40 millimeter or one and a half inch diameter core of N27 material. One of these cores runs about six bucks on Mauser, links below. There's only one problem. We need this core to have a 3.31 millimeter slot cut through it to get the inductance that we need. That slot gives us a lot more control over the AL property we talked about before, or how much inductance we get per turn of wire, among other things. Now this is called a gapped toroid, and we need this toroid to be gapped in order to achieve the performance required, making it a custom part. Now this is one of those it never hurts to ask scenarios with regard to samples, so I'll reach out to the good folks at Epcos or TDK and see what they can do for us. I expect that we'll be paying somewhere between seven and $15 for a semi-custom gapped version of this core, and well, that's where most of the cost for this inductor will be. 
our wire is actually very cheap. Just 62 turns of 13 gauge magnet wire with insulating tape between each layer of windings. This construction leads to an estimated total power dissipation of 4.325 watts per inductor and DC resistance of 33 milliohms. The estimated operating temperature of this inductor is 30 degrees warmer than the environment, so around 55 degrees C if operating at room temperature. $10 is a bit more than I'd prefer to be spending on these inductors, but I think it's still palatable. This is a very critical part of our design, so I think it's best to do it right than get hung up on cost. That's great, but can we find a better solution if we use an e-core instead? Well, another valid design would be using a gapped variant of a standard e-core rather than a gapped variant of a toroid, with a 2.07 millimeter gap in the centered leg. Gapping an e-core is actually easier for us to do in the shop since sanding, grinding, or lapping an e-core to add a precise gap is relatively easy with opposed to cutting a precise width slot. At least, we can do this with abrasion on a flat surface rather than requiring a saw. At any rate, the valid design we like best used two gapped E42-21-20 cores with N87 core material and 36 turns of 16 gauge enameled copper wire. These cores cost $2.69 each, so $5.38 for a pair should do the job excellently. The total losses for e-core inductor design are 6 watts, and the expected temperature rise is 39 degrees. This design will run us just a little bit warmer than the toroid, but still nothing to get too upset about. I'm very pleased with this design. Now if we gap the EE core inductors ourselves, this could be a great solution given that we can't find anything off the shelf rated for this kind of voltage. It's almost like magnetic companies don't want the liability of selling magnetics components that produce dangerous voltage. Either that or high voltage, high power inductors don't fly off the shelves like smaller, cheaper inductors used in switchboard power supplies do. We'll need to think about where we need to use insulating tape, what type of tape is required to achieve the insulation we need, and where we're crossing windings over one another. We need to consider if and how we're winding this inductor will introduce opportunities for arcing between those windings. Our 36 turn inductor may have up to 14 volts applied per turn across it. That adds up fast if we need to double back. If we go back and forth, we'll have like 400 volts on those adjacent windings. So we need to think about specifically how this inductor will be wound even after all of the math is finished. Where does this leave us then? We have two valid designs for our inductor with reasonable losses and two questions for TDK's magnetics division about how much it'll cost to get the custom gapped versions. After we get some cost information for a gapped E core and a toroid core from them, We'll know if this is a good path forward. In the meantime, our simulation tool is able to export some detailed electrical spice models. We'll use those in our simulation of the PFC, so we're ready for the next step in designing the subsystem. If you like what you saw today and can't wait for more, consider subscribing to be notified of our future videos where we'll run a transient simulation of the PFC and find a way to make the UPS have a neutral referenced inverter output. I think that magnetics design is a lot of fun, and if you think that inductors are cool, let me know by hitting the like button on this video, following us on Twitter, or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. So thank you for watching EE for everyone, and thanks for staying till the end. Bye!